Hey guys, it's Alex, and today I'm here with my video for the worst books I read in 2019. There are 11 books on this list that I felt like were deserving of being on the worst list. I always do my list at the end of the year, not by specific number, but just by what I feel like deserves to be on that list. If there are only five books that deserve to be on the list, then only five go on it. I just, I just go through literally every book I've read and pick out the ones that I feel like deserve to be here. This year there were 11. I do want to have the general disclaimer that I put on all like incredibly negative videos right off the bat. Just because something is a worst for me doesn't mean it is or should be a worst for you. It's almost like art is subjective or something. But like, for real, some of my close friends really love some of the books I have on this list, and that's okay. Like, like what you like, dislike what you dislike. Life goes on for everybody, and it's fine. These books are ordered not from what I think is actually the worst book, nor are they in chronological order. They're kind of ordered just in ascending order of how much they piss me off. The books that piss me off the least are at the beginning of the list, and the books that piss me off the most are at the very end, so I guess the worst of the worst is at the end. It's not a scientific method. I literally just sat down to make this list and was like, how much do I hate these books relative to each other? So all of the books on this list are one or two stars, but they're not necessarily all in the order that you think they might be. All three of the one star books I had this year are on the list. Not all of my two star books are, but a few two star books do make an appearance to like fill out the rest just because I don't give that many books one star. But we're going to start at the very beginning. I don't have any of these books with me for obvious reasons. I did used to own some of them and then promptly got rid of them after I realized they were trash. So I don't have any of them. So enjoy the lovely pictures of the covers that are going to be over here. The first book on this list is All Your Perfects by Colleen Hoover. I read this, I don't even remember, last spring. This is not a well-researched video, guys. I haven't like thought about any of these books in a long time. I read this last spring sometime, and I gave it one star at the time, and I almost considered not putting this on my list at all. Like that was a legitimate consideration I had, just because I didn't hate this book. This book didn't make me angry. A lot of the books on this list really piss me off, like still to this day, it's been months and I'm still mad at them. But this one never did. Like even when I read it for the first time, I wasn't angry at it. I wasn't pissed off at it. Like it, it almost doesn't fit on this list. It was just kind of devoid of anything that I enjoyed. And I do think one star might have been harsh. It's just that there literally wasn't anything that I liked about this book. There was nothing I liked. One of the characters who was supposed to be like a bad person occasionally made jokes or comments that I thought were funny and that was the only positive thing I could literally say about this book that was the one positive. It just, and it's not even that I thought it was bad, it was just done in a style I really didn't like. But then I did remember the one thing that pissed me off about it was the marketing. Nowhere in the description of this book did it say what the book was actually about. It said it was about a couple who got married and had relationship problems. And I was like, cool. I like relationship problems. I like romances that kind of deal with like the afters of the relationship. Like you've been together and now you have some problems in your relationship to get through. That's interesting to me. But then the problem in their relationship was that the main character couldn't, couldn't get pregnant. I think her name was Quinn or something. I don't remember. It's been too long. But she couldn't get pregnant. Like, and that was the problem, which is fine. Like, that's not a bad thing to write a book about. But nowhere did it say this in the description on either the book itself or Goodreads. And it's like, if that is the main crux of this story, that's the most important thing about this book to know going in. That's what this book was about. The entire book was about her not being able to get pregnant. And I just have no desire in reading that. Like, it's a fine storyline if you're interested in that. It's just, I had no desire in reading that whatsoever. So it was just kind of a bummer that, like, it ruined Colleen Hoover for me because I didn't like her writing style, but I, I would have liked probably any other book she's written at least better than that one because it wouldn't have just been about not being able to get pregnant, which I would rather just not read about. The second book on this list surprised me because I did think it was going to be a lot higher, and that is Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Nyan. I don't know that if this book is so low 
because I actually don't dislike it as much as I used to or if it's just because this was probably the first book I read on this list. I think I read it in January of last year, maybe February of last year. Maybe it's just faded so it doesn't piss me off that much anymore, but it doesn't. Like mostly what I remember about this book was that it was boring and pointless and her writing was like the stupid flowery writing that was just like pointlessly descriptive but it wasn't describing anything that was like important to the story like the descriptions didn't add anything they were just like flowery and generic and everything like sparkled like a jewel or whatever and that irritated me and I, I do remember there was some victim blaming in it that also irritated me but like I don't know mostly what I remember from this book is just that it was not worth the hype and it was just irritating and I don't know I'm not super pissed off at it now but at the time, I thought it was kind of trash. I still think it's kind of trash. I just don't think it's the kind of trash that is worth me caring about, which might be even worse, honestly. And also, to add early on in this video, I do have reviews for all of these books up, so if you want like actual thoughts on them <laughs> that are me like actually knowing what I'm talking about and having decent argument points, definitely go check out those reviews. They'll all be linked down below in the description box. I'm just like rambling about nothing here today because I don't remember half of these and I really don't care to go look because I thought all these books were trash. The third book on this list is The Wicked Girls by Alex Marwood. This was kind of a disappointment to me because it sounded good. The description said it was about two girls who committed a murder when they were very very young. They went to like juvenile prison, kid prison, whatever it's called. They were like 10 or something. Like they weren't like 16, 17. They were like small kids. And then they didn't see each other for 30 years and then there are more murders and they run into each other. I was like, that sounds cool. I love when like kid murders are explored, like kids being the killers. I think that's really interesting. This book didn't really focus on that at all. That was kind of like an unnecessary part of the book. And I don't want to spoil anything, but it was just kind of like a boring and pointless take on kids being killers. So that was dumb. And the book was also not suspenseful or plot twisty at all. And I like thrillers that do that because you can have a thriller that isn't full of like really shocking plot twists. You can have that fairly easily. It's not like necessarily a bad thing to write a thriller. It doesn't just have like ridiculous plot twists at every turn. Because you can write a thriller that's just like suspenseful in the nature that like you know what's gonna happen kind of but you're just like so invested in the character's journey getting there that it's that creates the suspense and it felt like that was what this book was going for I think <laughs> but it was just like really weird and convoluted and it just like went on for too long and there were too many like weird dissenting points that like went off in different directions and it was like look at this red herring over here and it was like but we already know who the killer is like, you already told us who the killer is so that's not a red herring and it was it was just an irritating book like it doesn't really piss me off it's just like one of those like slow burn irritation it's like why did i waste my time reading that and i know a couple of other booktubers read it as well and i don't think either of them particularly enjoyed it either it's just I don't know, it was just one of those like irritating in the sum of its parts kinds of ways. The next book is also a really big disappointment for me because it sounded so good and I actually read this for a book club with two other booktubers and they also were very excited for it and I don't think any of us liked it very much but I think I disliked it the most. That is The Girls Are Gone by Michael Broadcorp and Allison Mann. This is a non-fiction book, it's true crime so like there's always a lot of thrillers on my worst off list at the end of the year just because I'm so picky about thrillers and it's so hard to do them well and so easy just to write like a really bad thriller. But this is a true crime. It's about two girls who were kidnapped by their mother during the world's messiest divorce. <laughs> it was like a lot of ridiculous things were going on and this was written by a journalist and a paralegal at the firm of the father's lawyer. My thoughts on this were basically that I wanted to like it so badly. It was full of court transcripts and like actual like the actual court transcripts that you could read and just like see what was going on in the trial and that was so fascinating and I love the way that was interwoven into the story but it was like that was the only thing I liked and I think one of my commenters, I forget who it was, they were like, it's kind of funny that the only positive thing you had to say about this book 
was what the authors didn't actually write. And I was like, that's a solid point. Like, I can't argue that at all. It sounds really mean, but I can't argue with it. And like, that was that was it. Like, I loved reading the transcripts, but man, the rest of the book was rough because I didn't trust the authors. That was one of the most biased books I have ever read. Like, biased in favor of the father, which like makes sense because one of the authors was a paralegal at the firm where the father's lawyer worked. Like, it, it was very clearly biased, but they kind of pretended that they weren't and they were like presenting this in a very factual way but then they would say things that were just like very unnecessary he'd be like oh he oh, i can't remember any specific examples <laughs> but um it, he wrote something like the man violently vandalized the father's car and what really happened was the dude slashed his tires and it was like okay why would you use like that inflammatory language when you could actually say something that is very detailed very precise and like a lot less inflammatory but like equally shocking like that is a shocking horrifying thing and the whole book i felt like that i was like it's not that i'm not on the father's side it's not that i don't believe that these girls were kidnapped by their mother who seemed very unwell i guess is the most positive way to put it it was that i was like i want to be on the father's side because it seems like the father was the best side to be on like there was no like real positive there but i was on the father's side basically or i wanted to be it was just like the authors were so biased and it felt like so unnecessarily so either they were hiding really big things that like i didn't see and i just didn't know because there isn't a whole lot of information on the case or they were just writing it in a not a great way and because neither of them were crime reporters the one journalist guy was like a political reporter it, they just like failed in the writing i don't know it was one of the two but it was just really irritating and really disappointing and the longer i read that book the more pissed off i got and i think i posted like a 30 minute review of it just because i was like i have all these details all these details like all these specific quotes i want to read to illustrate this and i think to date that is my longest review that i've ever done the unedited footage was like an hour long and i've never spent an hour ranting about a book before with like all kinds of textual evidence and everything and it was it was kind of glorious and that's kind of like one of my favorite videos of all time but also like no one has watched it because it's 30 minutes about some indie published book that no one's heard of next on the list is a study in charlotte slash the last of august by Brittany cavallaro i don't think alone that a study in charlotte would have made this list i can't remember if i gave it two or three stars i might have given it two or three I really don't remember but i gave the last of august two stars and it was like there were a lot of problems i had with the first book that irritated me but at the end of the day i was like kind of invested i was kind of interested in the story it was kind of easy to get through and i was like oh, okay like irritating things but whatever then i read the last of august and it was like all the irritating things the bad relationship between charlotte and jamie that was just like weird bad like not even like toxic in a realistic way it just like i didn't buy anything that happened in that book it was like weirdly over the top and melodramatic but also just like weird it didn't make sense it was so convoluted and messy and i got to the end and i was like what just happened like not in like a wow shocking plot twist kind of way but in like a literal what just happened i don't understand what this story was or what that conclusion was it didn't make sense and i don't know it left a bad taste in my mouth like i don't have a lot to say about those books just because they were kind of very forgettable to me and i don't even think i did a review for the last of august because i was just done by that point i was like i don't want to think about this anymore but it wasn't very good didn't enjoy it um don't understand the hype for it and then rachel from book Poop also read it and <laughs> had like the same thoughts as me like she read this the first book and was like that's not very good and then read the second and was like that's worse and I think we both DNF'd it after two books. It's like one of the first series I've ever DNF'd. And it was like, it was so freeing not to have to continue that because I was not enjoying that at all. Next is also a sequel, except this time I only put the sequel on the list. And that is The Rose and the Dagger by Renee Audio. This is the sequel to The Wrath and the Dawn, which I mostly felt was kind of mediocre. It's a YA fantasy book set in like ancient middle eastern times it's a retelling of a thousand and one arabian nights the first one was okay like i think mediocre is kind of a good way to put it i didn't particularly enjoy it but it did go rather fast and i enjoyed it enough it was a three-star meh read 
The second one was worse in every way. I don't know what it was with just like bad sequels this year, but it was worse in every way. Like it took, there were these things in the first book that were like, oh my God, these are like the major points of the books. These are the major conflicts. How will we ever solve them? And I was like, okay, those are gonna be built up and solved in the climax of book two. And then they were solved in like the first 50 pages and never mentioned again in favor of like random new things that were brought in. And it didn't feel natural in a way. Like there are some ways where like you wrap things up and then the second book continues in like a different storyline. But it, that wasn't how it felt here. It felt like the first one didn't wrap up what it needed to. And then the second one was like, oh, there's your answer. Look at these new shiny things. Like don't think about that anymore. And it was very weird and unpleasant. And I didn't like any of the relationships. I didn't like any of the characters. It was very like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't like her writing super much. I don't know. It was not a, that was not a good one for me. Um, I, I buddy read that with Abby Mac Reads, and Abby really liked the first one like more than me, but then I think we both hated the second one quite a bit. And I think in general, people just think the second one is like worse than the first, regardless of like how much you liked either of them. Then we get to a very, very popular book on the list, which is Scythe by Neil Schusterman. I don't understand the, the hype for Scythe. It's a dystopian where death has been cured. And death has been cured. And there are people called Scythes that go around killing people because of overpopulation. They're like, let's cure death, but also let's kill people now because of overpopulation. And that was kind of that book. <laughs> um, no, like it wasn't the premise that was the problem. I was like, okay, with the premise, it didn't sound like my kind of thing, but my book club was reading it. So I was like, chill, like, I want to take part in this book club. I'll read things outside my comfort zone. It'll probably be okay, but like not great because it's not my kind of thing. Oh my God, did I hate that book. Like there's a reason it's this far down in the list. Like it really irritated me and I don't understand why people like it. There are plenty of books that I don't like, like Colleen Hoover. I gave that one star. And so far to this point, I've given the rest of these books two stars, but I don't like all your perfects, but I kind of understand why someone would. Like, I understand why someone would enjoy that book. It was just very much not for me. I don't understand why people like Scythe. And obviously people do, like a lot of people do. I, I have friends on here who really love Scythe. It's like one of their favorite books. And I just don't get it. <laughs> it was like, there's so many holes in this world, like things that just don't make sense. It's from the very, very big things, like the most important things that don't make sense. like why don't they set up a rule about how many children you can have or like how many births for the population? Like that seems like a thing that should happen if overpopulation is this much of a concern that you're intentionally killing people at random. <laughs> like that seems like A, the first thing to do. B, they kept saying like how life didn't mean anything anymore. They were like, life doesn't mean anything. Life's so like unimportant now that we live forever. But like literally, they don't live forever. They'd be like, art is meaningless because people are immortal. And like, art in the mortal times was so much more wonderful and so much more meaningful. But like, people still die. They die less. But I did the math in my review video. And I don't remember what the math was. But like, it, it was significantly less, but it wasn't like nothing. A lot of people still die. <laughs> it's like, if people are still dying and you still fear you fear the sides in the same way that today we fear death. It's a very different kind of fear. It's done in a different way and it's less, but it seems like it happens quite a bit in this world and it happens enough that you're not really immortal. Like mortality is still a thing. It's just different. And it just irritated me the whole book. I was like, I don't understand why anyone would like this. It was, it was so rough. And like, there were, there were so many things. And like, at the end it was like, oh, these kids have just outsmarted all these like, centuries old intelligent scholars who've done nothing but study this their entire lives and these two like dumb 16 year olds have like found loopholes in everything and it irritated me like i'm still like mad about this book like i read it not super long ago like compared to some of the other books on this list i think i read it in like august maybe it just like i still i still think about how mad it makes me sometimes like just i I don't know. I don't understand that book. Like there are a lot of books I don't like and I'm still like, okay, like I see why you would like that. I see why people like Six of Crows. I see why people like All Your Perfects. I don't understand what the the appeal is for Scythe. Like it just, I don't know. I'll probably never read Neil Schusterman again just because of like how irritated that one book made me. 
next book on this list, actually the next two books on this list are nonfiction, but this one is The Gilded Razor by Sam Lansky. This is a memoir of his time being addicted to drugs and him getting clean. This is what I said in my review too. Have you ever read those tweets that are like, and I still don't remember what the Twitter handle is. It's like that guy in your MFA or just at guy in MFA or something like that. And it's just, it's just like making fun of like the cishet white males who think that everything cishet white male is interesting and describe nipples in weird ways and like have terrible descriptions of women and just think they're inherently unique and special and all of that. Like, <laughs> if you've ever read those tweets, I feel like you have a very good understanding of this book. He complained so much about being middle class in this book. I was like, dude, I grew up middle class. Like, calm down. Your problems in life do not come from you being middle class. You can't literally sit there and complain that your father went to Berkeley and that makes your life harder in the sense that he didn't go to a good enough school. Like, it was so irritating and he seemed like so self-impressed. Just like, oh, he, he had the worst drug addiction you'd ever seen. It was the absolute worst. Like, no one has ever had a drug addiction this bad before. And like, everything he did was always the most. It didn't matter if it was the most good or the most bad, but it was always just the most. Like, he was at a rehab thing once. I forget what kind of, I think it was like an outdoorsy kind of rehab for like teenagers. He went to that and he was like, oh, I started talking to this girl because she was the other most interesting person there. And like, I don't remember a lot about all these books, but that line just stuck out to me. Cause like, imagine saying that and not just saying that, but writing it in a book that you publish and let thousands of people read the other most interesting person there, implying that you are the most interesting person there. And like, that's just one line, like whatever, but it kind of really captured like the whole feel of the story for me. <laughs> like he just thought he was the most impressive thing that ever walked on the planet. And he even seemed kind of like still impressed by how bad his drug addiction was. Like the same way people go into stories about how sick they were and they're like, oh, I wasn't just sick, man. I was like the most sick that ever was. I was so sick that I was doing X, Y, Z. I was so sick that I was hallucinating and not just normal hallucination, but like wild hallucinations. Like the way people are like, they have to make it like impressive how sick they were. That was kind of how I felt about him talking about his drug addiction, that it was like, it was so bad. It was like impressively bad. Like you don't even understand how bad, like no one has ever had a drug addiction that bad before. And like the title is like the worst part of this book or not the worst part, but it just like captures the book so perfectly. The Gilded Razor, he used to use a gold razor to cut up the Adderall that he snorted. Like that's, that's what the title means. And I'm like, dude, your lack of self-awareness. Like he tried to be self-aware, but it was such a failure. And like, I'm like half pissed off by this book and half just amused by it because it's one of like the funniest things I've ever read, but like not in an intentional way. So I think that meant it had to make this list. The next and last nonfiction book on this list, before we get back into the trash thrillers that I read, Smoke Gets In Your Eyes and Other Stories from the Crematorium by Caitlin Dowdy. I hated this book. It gets so much hype and so much love on booktube and like everywhere. And people are like, oh my god, it was so funny. It was so hilarious. Like, Caitlin Dowdy's great. Like, I love her. I read this book and there aren't a whole lot of nonfiction books that really make me hate the author. I'll be like, yo, not a fan of you, like Sam Lansky. I don't hate him, I just kind of like pity him, maybe, <laughs> if that's the way to phrase it. But like, I don't really hate him. I read Sue Klebold's book and it really irritated me, but I don't hate Sue Klebold, like whatever. I may not like people, but I don't hate them. Reading Smoke Gets In Your Eyes really made me hate her, like so much. And that was my problem with this book. It wasn't really the thing she was talking about. She just seemed, so condescending and so like holier than thou and like I know better and like these poor people who like don't have the good death rituals that I have and I, I can't like come up with specific examples because like it's been so long since I read this book but I also have a very long review on this book 
much like the girls are gone where i read a lot of quotes because i was like someone tell me that i'm not like hallucinating that these are like terrible things someone is saying at one point she like made fun of children's names she was like oh i mourn the babies who have names when they come in because someone obviously cared about them enough to give them a name even when their names are dumb like caitlin spelled the wrong way and i'm like why would you say that like that's not funny like i get gallows humor i really like black humor like i am a dark person but it's just like making fun of a dead child's name isn't really funny to me it's just like why would you say that a like it's a dead child b why does it matter how people spell their names or their kids names like how does it affect you how someone else spells their name like live just live your own life and stop judging everyone else she just came across as so judgy to me and it it really pissed me off like this is where we get to the point where like this book made me mad <laughs> and like it is the third slot on this list because of how mad it made me and like i gave it two stars but i don't know i'm not sure i deserve two stars all the time sometimes i think and i'm like maybe i should have just gone ahead and given it one because i really hated her if you want my more in-depth thoughts, I definitely recommend checking out that video because I'm not explaining myself well here, but like, man, I hated her. The second to worst book on this list, we're almost at the end, Black Seconds by Karen Fossum. This was translated from Swedish. It's a thriller. It's like a literary type thriller, which I thought was going to be super cool because I thought it was going to be like one of those thrillers where it doesn't really matter what the plot twists are because it's just like about the characters and their journeys, but like it's really dark and cool. And it wasn't, like, I think, I forget what page I figured out the plot twist on, but it was like, by page seven, I knew what the ending was. And not in a way where I feel like you were supposed to know, but in a way that was just like, painfully obvious. And I was like, why am I reading this? And none of the characters were interesting. I think I got through the book and I was like two thirds of the way through the book. And I still couldn't remember who one of the characters was. Like they would say her name and I was like, wait, who's that? Who, who are we talking about here? What's going on? Like, I read this book in a day, so it wasn't like I was forgetting. And I read a lot of books in a day. Like, that's normal for me. It wasn't an extended period of time. I wasn't skim reading. I was just like, why? Why does this exist? Like, I, I knew how it was going to end. And not like, I knew part of the ending, but there was like some extra plot twist on the end. Because sometimes that happens where it's like, you know the general gist of the end, but then something else happens to like add on to it. And you're like, oh my god, that's a cool change. But by about page 7 or 12, or it was something that was like ridiculously early on, I was like, I know exactly how this ends. None of the dialogue felt right either in that book. And like, I think maybe that was because it was translated. Maybe it sounded like right if you were reading it in the original Swedish. I have no idea. But the dialogue was like the fakest thing I've ever read in my life. And just in general, the writing was, I was not a fan. I was not a fan of that book. I gave that one one star and this is, <laughs> the last two here are both one stars, but I don't know. That was like the worst book I'd read in a minute up until I read the next book on this list, which I don't think will surprise anyone when I say that the final book on this list is 206 Bones by Kathy Rikes. Oh my god. I don't know when the last time was that I read a book that I thought was this bad. And that's still a lie. It was still The Pleasures of Men by Kate Williams, which is probably the worst book I've ever read in my life, and I still hate that book. And I really want, like, everyone to read it just so everyone can be like, oh my god, what was that book with me? <laughs> because it was bad. But we're not talking about that here because I read that in, like, 2017. 206 Bones. This is part of the Temperance Brennan series. It was, like, 12 books in or something like that. I never read any before. It was a bad place to start. I admit that. But that was not the whole problem with this book. She didn't bother introducing any of the characters. And like, you're supposed to read these books out of order. Or like, you're not supposed to, but you very easily can. It's a cop thriller series. You're kind of like, they exist and you read them however you want. They're all kind of meant to be standalones. But she never bothered introducing any of the characters. I still only know the main two characters, one of which was Temperance Brennan, and one of them was like, special agent Andrew Ryan, who was Celie Booth in the show, which like, why they changed that name, I don't know. I guess they thought Andrew Ryan was a dumb name. But then they get, they named him C.L.E. Booth, so like you can't really complain about Andrew Ryan anymore. Those were the only two characters we got to know. And the kicker of this is, 
It was a lab mystery. There was not like one specific murder they were investigating. They were investigating what was going on in the lab with their friends. And I didn't know who any of their friends were. I saw all the episodes of the show and I could still only barely like pick out the people who were kind of like corresponding to the, the people from the show. And I, I don't remember any of their names. I don't think I ever knew their names in the book. It was so weird. It was so hard to follow, but also like the most obvious storyline, like plot twist, the person that you keep repeatedly calling evil and manipulative is the bad person. Who could have imagined that? Like they, they literally, the villain who they discovered in the end, they had literally already called her evil. A character in the book had called her evil multiple times. She'd been called manipulative and incompetent and just like all kinds of terrible things. And everybody knew this. Everybody hated that character. And yet everybody was shocked in the end when it turned out they were the bad guy. I didn't even realize it was meant to be a lab mystery until like halfway through the book because it was so obvious. I was like, oh, that can't possibly be the story. Like when does the actual plot start? Because you kind of realize what's going on, who the bad guy is, the first time that's introduced. So I kind of thought it was just like common knowledge. They were like, oh, someone in the lab is bad. And I was like, okay, I guess it's the bad person. And everyone was like, who could possibly be bad in the lab? We're like a family. It's like, except for this evil person over here that you all hate, who could possibly be the bad one? And it was just so pointless and it was so, so rambling and she would go off on these tangents about things that did not matter in the slightest and when I say didn't matter I mean didn't mostly not matter to the story but literally had no bearing on anything she spent like a whole page on the Chicago Transit Authority like why literally why what did the Chicago Transit story have to do with anything most of this book was set in Canada like <laughs> she went on a vacation to North Carolina or South America or something with her daughter and then it was just like never mentioned again and the daughter was never like really introduced she was just kind of like talked about in the third person she was like oh I'm going on vacation with my daughter and everyone was like have a good time <laughs> and there was at one point where she literally went on for a page about monastery cheese she was like oh when I think of this place I think of monks monastery cheese and something else I don't remember and it was two pages on those three things one page on the monks and the monastery cheese and like let's discuss that and it was literally never mentioned before that or after that it was just this one page about monastery cheese I don't understand why anyone likes this book or this series the series is very popular and I looked at ratings and this book has about average ratings for like the rest of the series it's not the highest it's not the lowest it's not like people were like oh well this book is terrible but read the rest of the series it's good and I'm curious, like, if this book is so bad, like, how is the rest of the series? Like, is it also bad? Because this was a bad place to start. But even had I known who the characters were and had, like, an introduction to, like, the people and the story and the lab, I still would have hated this. Like, this book was so bad. <laughs> like, I can't, it is not possible for me to overstate how terrible I thought this book was. It was really terrible. I would say read it for the amusement, except it was so boring and painful and I almost DNF'd it. I don't really ever DNF books, especially because I don't like them. I usually DNF them because I haven't read them in like two months and I don't really plan to reread them to get to the point of the end. <laughs> but this book, I literally almost DNF'd it and I'm so disappointed in myself that I didn't because it didn't get better. It never got better. It was terrible at the beginning. It stayed terrible through the middle and then the ending was very terrible where they didn't even have a climax. Temperance Brennan was like unconscious the whole time while the climax was happening and at the end of the book she and the Sealy Booth character just sat down with each other and were like hi how are you let's talk about what just happened and how the book ended it was like because you couldn't have one even remotely decent thing about this book so let's end there on the terribleness that was 206 bones thank you for watching me rant for an unnecessarily long time I really appreciate your patience in this video and your patience with all of my negativity. As always, leave a comment down below if you have thoughts on any of these books, and thank you so so much for watching.